Good morning. I'm Lisa Wallace, Minister of Discipleship and Mission, I'm, and I welcome you all to Wapping Community Church on this colder than Alaska but beautiful Sunday. <laughs> Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome in this sacred place. As I always tell you, this is a vibrant Christian community, so please check your bulletin for the things going on. If you'd like to get connected, if God is putting or leading you in a direction ministry-wise and you're not exactly sure how to do that or how to get started or how to key into it, please see Reverend Mark or myself or any of the deacons who are wearing silver medallions and we would be happy to make that connection and help you make those dreams come true. So we can meet and greet each other by name. Please sign the pew pads located at the aisle section of each of your pews. And if you're visiting for the first time, we are so delighted that you're here. And we're really excited since you would come all the way into the cold to come here and be with us. Please visit the gathering room to my right where there's a visitor's table. We encourage you to sign the visitor registry and we would love to reach out to you if you would provide your contact information. And there is a star gift there as well for you from Wapping Community Church. I'm not sure if there's Fellowship Cafe today. Does anybody know? Okay, so we'll just kind of go through the community room and see what happens with that. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know about something really wonderful that's happening in the church. It's called Community Conversations on Faith. And Reverend Mark is leading that discussion. We already had one. We are going to have the next one next week. Right, Mark? Week after next. Week after next. I think it's January 25th and February 8th. So be sure to come if you can. It's at 7 o'clock in the fellowship uh, hall. And if you have any questions on your faith or would just like to hear the conversation and hear <coughs> what others are thinking about and experiencing, please come. It was wonderful the first time, and I know it's going to be wonderful as the continuing two-part left series. I think I'd like to ask Holly to come up. She has a, a very important thing to share about a dinosaur. Good morning. On the night of the Christmas concert, on my way out to my car, it was very dark outside, but I managed to see this in the parking lot. Can everyone see it's a, it's some sort of dinosaur uh, that I think a four-year-old. I did run it. Yay! I did run it through the dishwasher. It's squeaky clean. Holly, thank you for rescuing him. Thank you. These things are treasures. The treasures in the family, treasures to children. And I see that smiling face, so that made it all worthwhile. Thank you so much. We also have an important announcement about the chili brownie cook-off. Come on up, guys. Hi, my name is Jack. And my name is Andrew. And we're part of SPF. SPF is hosting the annual Chili Brownie Cook-Off next week, uh, right after the second service in the community room. Tickets are on sale after every service, $5 for adults and $2 for children 10 and younger for all you can eat. You can compete in the Chili Brownie Cook-Off for an entry fee of $10 per entry, or you can <laughs> sign up to become one of the tasting judges. There will be prizes awarded for judges' favorite and people's choice, and this year we will have a new twist of a silent auction. So please join us for some great food, music, and fun. Proceeds will help SPF in this summer's mission trip to South Dakota, so hope to see you next weekend. And we do need people to make chili and brownies because we do not have that many. So come on down and make some chili or brownies. It'll be tasty. Yeah. Sounds great, guys. This is an annual tradition nobody wants to miss. And thank you to those of you who went to the Burton's fundraiser, another fundraising event for SPF. That was great. The food was great. The conversation was great. And we were able to, to put a little, a little more into that caddy for the mission trip coming up. So thank you for that. An official announcement by Larry. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Larry Brown, one of your two clerks. 
The 2018 annual meeting of the members of Wapping Community Church shall be held on Sunday, January 28, 2018, immediately following the second service. Annual reports will be received and the membership will elect officers, adopt a budget plan, and other business proper to come before the congregation. Please note in the parish post that you, I hope, just recently received, there is information about an intended congregational discussion immediately to follow it. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. I encourage all of you to come, those of you who normally come and those of you who haven't ever come. It's a really good place to get to know what's going on in the church and to participate in that conversation. So we do hope to see you there. Any other mission updates to share? Let's begin our worship service and Michael McClellan will come and lead us in the call to worship. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> a child once dreamed the voice was calling his name, Samuel. Fishermen once heard the voice when a young man bid them follow. And still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here we are, send us. Moses protested vehemently as the voice spoke at the burning bush. Mary stood amazed as the voice proclaimed impending birth. And still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here we are, send us. Rosa Parks followed the voice to the front of the bus. Martin Luther King Jr. heard the voice as he marched, and still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here we are, sentence. The voice beckons from humble places, in the tears of hungry children, in the cries of the frail and frightened elderly, in the pleas of those whose dreams have too long deferred, and still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here we are, sentence. A timid believer, pauses to listen to the voice. The struggling church hears the voice and listens, and still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here we are, send us.
Please join me in the prayer of invocation. <clears throat> God of God all, all prophets, prophets, this week this weekend, we remember, we remember the life and legacy, legacy of Martin Luther, Luther King, King Jr., Jr. who witnessed, witnessed to your radical, inclusive love. Help, help us, us to carry, carry forth his call and your, your call to justice, justice beyond this Sunday and into our daily lives. lives. Give us the courage to stand with the poor and the oppressed, oppressed and empower us to build a better future for our children and generations to come. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. your neighbor and greet them with a sign of peace. The peace of Christ be with you. We come to a time of prayer. I will get us started and then please feel free to share any praises or concerns on your heart. Just raise your hand and I'll come around with the mic and after each person shares we'll say, God, hear our prayers. So please be in a spirit of prayer with me. Oh God, you are so wonderful, and we thank you for the privilege of meeting today together to be in your presence and to love one another. It is a huge blessing and a huge honor and privilege, and we thank you richly for that blessing. God, a brand new year, brand new star for the church, the star of insight, a brand new star for each individual who wants a star. And beyond that, we know you're speaking to us, that you are the voice that we desire to follow more than the voices around us. Lord, help us in, in the dead of winter to get quiet, to curl up, to get cozy, and to spend some time hearing your still small voice. It still guides. It still provides wisdom. It still sheds love. Let that happen in our hearts abundantly. Change us continually, Lord, to be better and better, to be more and more loving and caring and wise like you. Oh God, thank you for this Sunday when we celebrate Martin Luther King. He was a great voice. He mobilized so many people. He had a dream. Help us to have your dream, God, and be effective in the world, just as effective in your plans as Martin Luther King was in your plans for him. Help us to realize that we are important to you, that you love us beyond description, that we can run to you with everything, and that you have miracles in store for us, big and small, and everything that we need is with you. Oh God, help us to love justice like you do. Help us to be the arm of mercy and care. Help us to give forgiveness when we need to, to travel lightly along the way that you have created for us to walk. Lord, Help us to realize that not only are we important to you, we are important in the world. No matter who we are, or where we are, or what we're doing, the nooks and crannies of our life are being weaved by you into something much larger that affects everything, affects history. We and what we do and what we choose to do, the voices we choose to listen to and the voice we choose to be, are important to you, and our time is appointed. Help us not squander the time. Help us to live that life and that charge well. Go before us and smooth the way that we can walk in it and walk beside us, as you always do. God, thank you 
for the places in life that are dark that you're working on, Lord. You're bringing people and circumstances, perspectives into those dark places. We pray that the light would shine bright in spite of the darkness, for the darkness did not overcome it. Oh God, we pray for people who are in need, especially people who don't know what to do next. They don't know what they believe. And they're unsure of the next move in this life. We pray for people who do not know if this life is worthwhile. We pray, Lord, that you would show them that it is. We pray, Lord, that you would be the light for the people who live in darkness, wherever they are. Even if they're sitting right here in this congregation, we all have dark places that need your light. We follow your star in that. We pray for people who are suffering, who are in pain, who are in agony and need relief. They need your heavenly touch and a miracle from heaven, we pray, for all of these things to come to fruition. We thank you, God, that you are our God and we are your people. And now come, Lord, and hear the prayers of your people. Oh God, we thank you for all these prayers, the ones spoken, the ones unspoken, and the ones that aren't yet formed, but are expressions of our deepest longings and desires. Through the power of your spirit, we pray that you go out into the world doing wonderful, miraculous work in the lives of each of us, and through all the circumstances we've lifted up to you. May your glory shine. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray in one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And, and lead, lead us not into temptation, temptation but deliver us from evil. evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. This morning's scripture lesson from the Gospel of John can be found on page 967 in your pew Bible. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. If you didn't have a chance to hear Oprah Winfrey's speech at the Golden Globe Awards last Sunday night, I imagine a number of you have heard about her speech or maybe watched a recording of her speech in the weeks since. If you didn't see it, 
I commend Oprah's words and her pitch-perfect oration of those words to you. For me, watching Oprah was a little like going to church for the second time last Sunday. While Oprah's speech received a standing ovation from her entertainment industry colleagues in the audience last Sunday night, and widespread acclaim across America in the days that followed, I've been really fascinated to note the focus of that acclaim. Centered around one particular question that seems to have taken on a life of its own. Many people across our country are now wondering whether Oprah Winfrey will actually run for president in the year 2020. Will she or won't she? I worry a bit, however, that questions about Oprah for president are overshadowing what I heard as the primary emphasis in Oprah's speech. Whatever happens in the next election, regardless of any choice Oprah Winfrey might make, is still a couple of years away. In the meantime, I heard Oprah Winfrey offer a clarion call for all of us to listen and to give voice to people who are nameless and invisible in our society. How do you and I take up the fight against racism and sexism and injustice on behalf of people who don't make headlines and are forced to endure oppression and victimization largely silently? And what's more, how do we take up the fight immediately, not sometime in 2020 or beyond? Oprah Winfrey's speech a week ago was a speech about empowerment, speaking directly to young girls and young women of color and to all people indirectly. Oprah echoed by implication the famous and elusive words of Gandhi who once said, be the change you want to see in the world. And then Oprah urged humanity to build a world where all voices will be heard and all stories will be taken seriously and all dreams will be deemed possible. The empowerment message in Oprah Winfrey's speech stands in stark contrast to the prevailing message we hear so loudly in our culture in this celebrity age. I can fix it. Leave it to me. Trust me, believe me, follow me, and I will get it all straightened out. Politicians and CEOs and mo noted public figures. How many times do we hear somebody stand up in our culture and narcissistically anoint themselves as the savior for whatever it is that might ail us? Meanwhile, the rest of us rush to jump on the messianic bandwagon. And yet the truth is we would do a whole lot better in this country if people would come together and fix our problems instead of propping up one person after another as the newest people's champion and expecting them to do it single-handedly. Everyone benefits when we move from passive, passive acceptance of the one in power to shared, intentional, mobilized, communal participation. We'll come back to that idea in a few moments. <coughs> this morning's scripture lesson appears at the beginning of John's gospel, at the very outset of his public ministry. In fact, today's story of the wedding at Cana is a coming out party of sorts for Jesus. A whole group of villagers go to a wedding. Perhaps it was the wedding of Jesus' first cousin, although we don't know for sure. In ancient Palestine, weddings lasted for an entire week. And the expectation was that the host would provide enough wine to permit a free flow from the beginning of the week all the way to the end of the week. 
making wedding feasts a marked departure <coughs> from the poverty and the hard work that characterized the majority of daily life in those first century villages. When the wine ran out at this particular wedding feast in Cana, it was undoubtedly a source of some embarrassment and humiliation to the hosts. And Mother Mary made the problem clear to her son, Jesus, in precious few words. They have no wine. It is amazing how mothers have a way of cutting right to the chase. At first, Jesus resisted his mother's hint. Perhaps Jesus simply wasn't in the mood to perform on command what might have seemed to him like a magic trick. But Mother Mary persisted as mothers often do. Maybe Mary wanted to show her son off just a little bit. Or maybe Mary knew something about the divine power of her son that Jesus didn't quite understand or hadn't yet fully harnessed. In any case, Jesus eventually wound up turning 150 gallons of water into wine, allowing the wedding feast to continue in all of its uninterrupted glory. And when the wedding was finally over, the gospel writer identified this miracle in Cana as the very first sign of Jesus' divine identity. Looking back, there are at least two claims we can make in relation to what Jesus did that day long ago. First, everybody had a great time at the wedding, at least partly due to the fact that there was plenty of wine to go around thanks to Jesus. Second, and more importantly, Scripture informs us that all the disciples saw Jesus perform this water-into-wine miracle and they believed in him. <clears throat> we become our best selves, I think. Not when we promise to be all things to all people, and then we try to deliver what no one person ever can. Instead, we achieve our best selves when we become part of something bigger than any one person. In the end, you and I don't have to be the ones turning the water into the wine, but surely we can be among the people who delight when the wine never runs out. Yes, the miracle of the wedding at Cana needed one Jesus, but it also needed a small group of disciples who trusted Jesus enough to believe in him, and it needed dozens of villagers who were eyewitnesses right there to lend credibility to the story and without whom the wedding feast would never have taken place in the first place. All of those people came together at the outset of John's gospel to form the beginning of what would eventually become a brand new religious movement. The same can be said about Oprah Winfrey's speech last Sunday. Yes, Oprah singled out Sidney Poitier and Reese Taylor and Rosa Parks by name, prominent men and women of color who broke boundaries and pushed this country forward in the struggle for civil rights. But Oprah's speech was not ultimately about the ones who garnered headlines. In Oprah's own words, it was about women whose names we'll never know. They are domestic workers and farm workers, she said. They are working in factories and they work in restaurants. And they're in academia, engineering, medicine, and science. They're part of the world of tech and politics and business. They're our athletes in the Olympics. And they're our soldiers in the military countless, nameless, invisible people banding together as allies in a fight for something greater and more just and more transformative than their own personal agenda.
Likewise, the same can be said on this weekend when we honor one of our nation's greatest leaders and champions of justice. Yes, the civil rights movement needed one Martin Luther King Jr. But it also needed a small group of brave people to sit down and to desegregate a lunch counter. And it needed dozens of peaceful protesters walking arm in arm across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. And it needed 5,000 people to boycott the buses in Montgomery, Alabama. And it needed hundreds of thousands of people to gather in Washington, D.C. around the reflecting pool in the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial to hear Dr. King deliver his I Have a Dream speech. In Martin Luther King Jr.'s own words, it was about all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Catholics and Protestants, joining hands and singing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Countless, nameless, invisible people banding together as allies to fight for something greater and more just and more transformative than their own personal dreams. Jesus Christ and Martin Luther King Jr. and Oprah Winfrey in her speech last week at the Golden Globes, they call people to come together and they call people to lift one another up for the common good. That is truly a radical concept in our nation which does so well championing the individual, not to mention vilifying the individual. No matter how many times you and I encounter true joy and genuine meaning from using our gifts for the common good, singing in a choir together, standing shoulder to shoulder at a protest march, <coughs> swinging a hammer side by side with someone at a Habitat for Humanity workday, no matter how many times we know the power of community, we still get sucked into the myth of individual success and individual failure. Life works best not when we're caught up in celebrity-driven narcissism and constantly on the lookout for the latest rescuer. Life works best when communities of people manifest the Holy Spirit for the good of the whole. Each one of us adding the gifts we have been given by God, thereby, thereby generating enough power to save and to deliver us all. Amen.
our morning offering this day, looking towards the day of peace and justice that Jesus promised to all who follow in his footsteps, the day which Martin Luther King and so many others preached and taught about, the offering we received. God, we pray that you would bless and multiply these gifts and bless each one of us, that we might faith, be faithful in all our discipleship, that we might walk in the footsteps of prophets who went before us, and that we too might seek justice and peace in our world in which we live. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
February 4th in 1968, two months exactly before he would be assassinated. On the balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Martin Luther King Jr. preached a sermon. And that sermon was entitled, The Drum Major Instinct. And these are the final words he spoke in his sermon that day. And that's all I want to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian ought, if I can bring salvation to a world once wrought, if I can spread the message as the master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Yes, Jesus, I want to be on your right side or your left side, not for any selfish reason. I want to be on your right side or your best side, not in terms of some political kingdom or ambition. But I just want to be there in love and in justice and in truth and in commitment to others so that we can make of this old world a new world. Amen.